Not too many people know this, and that is why I'm sharing this with you. This is where the federal government grows medical marijuana. Question is, since it's legal under federal law, obviously, and the states make it legal, then why is it still illegal? The issue here is called federalism. Federal law versus state law. The case, Peter McWilliams and Todd McCormick versus the United States of America, Incorporated. Who is Todd McCormick? Todd McCormick is perhaps the best cannabis cultivating expert on the planet. He didn't just become this by being a pothead. In fact, he had cancer called histiocytosis X as a child and now lives with four fused vertebrae. In 1996, Peter McWilliams found out that he had AIDS and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. With the help of doctors at UCLA and the use of medical marijuana, he was able to take his viral load all the way down to zero. So Peter teamed up with Todd McCormick because he wanted a book to be written called How to Grow Medical Marijuana. During the writing of the book, Todd McCormick was busted for growing 4,000 marijuana plants in his Bel Air mansion. Keep in mind that he was following state law. And Peter's crime? Peter's crime was agreeing to publish a book called How to Grow Medical Marijuana so that he could save his fellow man and fellow sufferers of the AIDS virus. In mid-March, 1996, Peter was diagnosed with both AIDS and cancer on the same day. To treat his illness, Peter was prescribed a myriad of drugs that all seemed to produce nausea and eventually make him throw up. In 1996, California voters passed Proposition 215, making the use of medical marijuana legal. The only medication that worked for Peter in controlling the nausea and his constant vomiting was medical marijuana. While on medical marijuana, Peter could keep in his important AIDS medications and it virtually eliminated the AIDS virus in his body. Because of his findings, Peter teamed up with Todd McCormick, a cancer survivor and cannabis cultivating expert, to publish a book called How to Grow Medical Marijuana. During the writing of the book, Todd McCormick was busted for growing medical marijuana in a Bel Air mansion. Todd's income had come from the book advance from Peter McWilliams and the federal government named Peter a drug kingpin. Federal Judge George King ordered Peter McWilliams off his medical marijuana, which was responsible for keeping in his AIDS medication. And so the judge is being asked essentially, please keep me alive at least until my trial. I'm not asking the judge to make a decision for the world. I'm not asking the judge to make a decision for everyone. I'm simply asking the judge, would you please keep me alive until this trial begins in September, when the larger issues can be determined. There are large issues to be determined in this case, such as whether all patients should be entitled to medical marijuana who have a doctor's prescription. That's not the issue we're asking here. The specific issue that we're asking the court is, please make an emergency exception so that I might be alive eight months from now when the trial begins. Also keep in mind that the federal system does not follow speedy trials. The earliest trial date we can get begins September 7th, and that may be extended. So it's not as though the trial is next week and it will be determined by a jury. It's that we have seven, eight more months uh, plus the trial time, so we won't have a determination until at least mid-October. Uh, in all of this. So between now and then, the likelihood of me developing an opportunistic infection and dying is extremely high. I feel that I have a good defense. I feel that I'm entitled uh, to take medical marijuana in general. I believe that every person who has a doctor's prescription is entitled to take medical marijuana. I, however, do not believe that my day in court should be taken from me. And that's essentially what's happening. Todd McCormick's urine analysis was found to have THC in it, a chemical that is in Marinol, a prescription pain medication, and it is also the active ingredient in marijuana. McCormick is a cancer survivor who has five fused vertebrae that leave him in constant pain. He began smoking marijuana as a child. California voters legalized the medicinal use of 
pot for the passage of Prop 215 two years ago, but the federal government doesn't recognize the state law. Legal under state law, and Todd is relied in good faith on state law. So of course he's torn up. I, I mean, I'm sick to my stomach over this. It, it's outrageous. McCormick's been free on a half million dollars bail, but late Thursday afternoon, U.S. Marshals showed up at his Laurel Canyon home to arrest him. He allegedly violated his bail by flunking a drug test. Officials say THC, a chemical contained in both marijuana and Marinol, a legal prescription drug, was in his blood. In court this morning, McCormick. He insisted Marinol, the legal painkiller he was taking, was responsible for the positive test. The federal magistrate James McMahon was unmoved and ordered him jailed. Right now, physically, he is suffering. Mentally, he is suffering. Emotionally, he is suffering. There's nothing anyone can do for him right now. Just the system is raking a human being over the coals because of politics. He said it best. How can they put me in prison? When all I'm doing is taking my prescription medication, which is legal under federal law, and that's what's happening here. This home is much more impressive on the outside than in. There's some truth to that, young. If we don't uh, seize real, uh, real property or personal property, we don't have any money to operate. What do you do when the federal government doesn't recognize state law? My name is Irvin Rosenfeld. And I'm one of seven people, the government says, in the United States that receives medical marijuana, medical cannabis from the federal government. I receive 12 marijuana cigarettes a day and have for 21 and a half years. The name of my disorder is multiple congenital cartilaginous exostosis and a variant of the syndrome pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism, which means in lay terms, bone tumors on the ends of long bones that can grow forever and I can develop new ones at any time. So if the federal government has legalized marijuana, and the states have legalized marijuana, then who is keeping it illegal? Could it be the special interest groups? Could it be the prison guard union? Could it be the pharmaceutical industries? How powerful they have become to where they could rig our judicial system, and pay judges, and kill patients. With your uh, T cell count in the 200,000s? 250,000. 250,000. What is the probability that uh, you'll make it through the year? Or Very low. Or I mean, if something doesn't change, the probability is extremely, extremely low that I'm going to make it to trial. Trial's in September, and this is the end of February. So with a viral load like that, um, the prognosis is dim. Last time your viral load hit in the 20,000s, you picked up a kind of cancer? Yeah, and my viral load was at 12,500 three years ago, which was the highest it's ever been prior to this. I had already developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the most, second most common AIDS-related cancer. So now my viral load is 20 times higher than it was when I had already developed a fatal opportunistic illness. So you're almost like an exposed target to catching cancer at this point, is that? Totally an exposed target to catching anything. There's 30 opportunistic infections I can catch, um, any one of which could wipe me out. Um, the it, fact that I had developed cancer before, which you don't need to catch from anybody, that's already in your system. The fact that that, that, that cancer was there, and non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma is a deadly form of cancer. It's, it's what killed Jackie Kennedy. So it's a, it's a virulent form of cancer. So to have that cancer again, and especially to have that cancer, I responded to chemotherapy with that cancer, but I also was able to use medical marijuana to keep down the chemotherapy right. medication. Exactly. So now I would be getting chemotherapy um, without the benefit of medical marijuana if I had to go back in again. Right. And so, if I can't keep down AIDS medications, I'm not going to be able to keep down chemotherapy, which is even more nausea produced than the AIDS medication. So, to put it simply, the longer you wait for the judge to make up his mind, uh, the more probable you will die. Yes. The longer it takes for the judge, or for the judiciary, or for the government to decide that, in this case, an exception should be made, the probability just the possibility, but the probability that I'm getting sicker and sicker. It certainly feels that way, but that I'm developing some 
opportunistic illness that cannot be treated um, is, is very high. And the longer the government waits, the more jeopardy I'm put in. Thus far, the government has waited patiently for six months while it's given me this day in court. We've been working, we've been going through the system to get to this day in court ever since my arrest, essentially. And now that this day has come and gone, what, do, what does it look like for you now? Well, the judge will make his ruling. He'll do that in writing. Judge King will make a ruling. Uh, judge King will rule accordingly. Um, if Judge King rules in my favor, then I'll be able to use medical marijuana. If Judge King rules against me, then we'll appeal it to the Ninth Circuit Court. Uh, if Judge King rules in my favor, I would imagine the prosecution will also appeal it to the Ninth Circuit Court as well. Does the judge have a statute of time in which he has to send your case through so that you can be no. heard? Or can this be no. drawn on out throughout the year? And the, ju you know? the judge can... Um, there's no, no law that tells the judge when he has to come up with any response to this at all. Not a... Nothing. There's nothing legally that tells him that. Not um, cruel, morally, not but, cruel and unusual punishment, not I, nothing I like that. I believe the judge is truly concerned about this. The judge said that he was struggling mightily with this. I believe him when he says that. I don't think he's taking this lightly. I think he really is looking at the issue. I think he fully understands the issue. I think that he will make a decision after a great deal of soul searching on his part. Um, it is not an easy decision for him to make. Um, and whatever the decision will be, um, will not be one that he will have arrived at um, easily. What we will have, however, is the benefit of his thinking on the decision. He will write a written opinion, which will almost certainly lay out his thinking and his determination and why he arrived at the conclusion he arrived at, whether it's favorable or unfavorable. I expect that within a week to ten days uh, from now. Well, I, I hope that that's the case because this certainly isn't the way that America wants to treat a New York Times bestselling author, I tell you that. I don't know, all the other authors, I'm just less competition. <laughs> I'm out of the way, you know, it's like... Yeah, possibly. The, the, less, the less authors there are, the more spots on the New York Times list for all the other ones. That's you know? true, I didn't Absolutely. think about that. You know, authors, <laughs> authors are vicious. Here's one solution for you, What's that? which is, well, you know how the insurance companies are such a big lobby that they uh, uh, interfered with Hillary Clinton's health care plan. Oh, absolutely. So you know how much power they have. They so should power. take out a bunch of life insurance, and the insurance companies <laughs> will fight for, for your rights. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. For me to get Go life in. insurance is about... It's about as likely as me getting late these days. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> Sounds like a hot concept for Hollywood to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, we feel for you, but not enough. Yeah. <laughs> they did pass a law in California, specifically for this reason. Why do you have to be jailed and arrested and, and kicked around, literally, by, the, uh, by uh, the police? For what reason? How did they get to you when the people of California said, yeah, Todd should have his marijuana if it, in fact, helps? Well, what you're listening to need to know is right now there is a big, a big fight between what is called federalism, that's our government's will to, to uh, rule over us, yeah. democracy, right. our ability to change the laws which we feel are unjust. And what we've witnessed in 1996 in November was over four and a half million Californians coming together and saying, you know, we think that the medical use of this substance is ridiculous and should be legal. It is absolutely not the same as someone just smoking a joint. Right. You know, for the hell of it. Mm -hmm. And what the federal government is saying, no, a war on drugs is just that, a war on drugs. And we do not care. We have no empathy for the sick and dying. If you're an AIDS or a cancer patient, we don't care. You can suffer. We are going to put you in jail, we are going to imprison you, we don't care if you're importing 100 pounds of methamphetamine or if you're smoking or growing a little bit of pot, you are a criminal. That is, it really is pathetic, and again, it flies in the face of, look at the DUI problem in America. Drug, dr driving under the influence in every city, 
is a major issue because it claims so many lives. This argument's been around forever, but no one seems to be able to point to a fatality that is directly related to marijuana. You All still right. don't find it. You don't find it in driving. You don't find it on the job. You don't find people falling off the flagpoles, falling off the roofs, We're walking... You a bunch of college kids going off and buying a pound of marijuana and smoking themselves to death. But you hear about the buying a few fifths of whiskey and killing themselves. Dude, I'm going to tell you one more obvious one, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard this uh, as well. When you get a bunch of people drinking together, and some of them can't handle the alcohol, you could be looking at fights, you can be looking at all kinds of misunderstanding and violence. You don't see that with, with a, a group. California passed Proposition 215, making medical marijuana legal within the state of California. The only problem is, the federal government does not believe in the law. In my mind, it's impossible that a jury of 12 Californians who voted 56.4% to allow medical marijuana use under a doctor's care, mm -hmm. that not one of those juries is going to vote for acquittal. Therefore, we'll have a hung jury. I also can't believe that 12 jurors can't look at the facts of this case and say that, yes, it's important that we keep drugs away from young people. Yes, it's important that we make a stand against drug abuse. But in this case, where Peter McWilliams clearly had the recommendation of his physician, who had been treating him since 1996 for AIDS, that this issue is one that should be decided between himself and his doctor. I'm, I'm not a drug dealer. I've never sold a drug in my life. I'm not a drug kingpin. I'm, 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 I'm a sick person. I have AIDS. I've been trying to treat my illness. I've been trying to stay alive. I thought that in 1996, when I was diagnosed with both AIDS and cancer, that I was facing the, the real challenge of my life, and it turns out that the real challenge of my life is coming from my own government. I came home from uh, Vietnam, and I was caught up in another war, and it was the war on drugs, and I spent two years in prison for marijuana. I was shot by the cops and spent a year in the hospital. I had my lover beat up, and 10 million of my friends arrested. I watched the Bill of Rights shredded in front of my eyes, all in the name of drugs. And the final war of my life was the war against AIDS, where I was to lose my lover and hundreds of my friends. And you know what the people in California did? They slapped down people in the face. And they voted for it, and we legalized it. And now these sore heads, you know what they say now? People fool, you're stupid. And that is why it has taken me to this moment in my life. That I believe that these guys are not just about marijuana. That they have an agenda. And it's filled with hate and everything that is un-American. And that is why I am compelled to run for governor of this state. Ask me. 
Well, what, what is your message? My message is three words. It's hope. It's a word that Harry Milk taught me. He told me that people can't live without hope. That they gotta have hope, or they're not gonna feel a part of America. And empowerment. I got that from Martin Luther King, growing up in the 60s. And so did Martin Luther King, empowered people. And they took that power, and they took back America. And they got their vote, and they got their rights. And compassion. I got that from my younger, young lover, Jonathan, who died of AIDS, who taught me the meaning of compassion. That it is love and action. So what happens, Americans, when our votes are not listened to? 9,600,000 Californians voted on Proposition 215. The government refuses to listen to us. The only choice now is to have Congress listen to this information from the FDA and NINA regarding medical marijuana from the Missoula test case in the study. NIDA released information about your Missoula test case study and, and the question had to do with why uh, FDA or NIDA haven't released results from the chronic use study that was done with the compassionate use IND people. I think that that would be a proper question to address to them. Specifically, we did the study to look at the effects of uh, chronic cannabis use in medical uh, context. Uh, both for the benefits and the possible adverse effects. Um, anyway, again, that study is available. Uh, I can get to anyone if they'd like to email me. But as to why uh, it hasn't been addressed by the government, that's a proper question for them to address. I'm standing here on the uh, other side of locked gates where, as you can see here, they are locked. I don't want to get in too much trouble. This is where the federal government grows medical marijuana for the five remaining patients. The question is, if the federal government grows marijuana, that means they recognize marijuana as a medicine. And if the states have legalized medical marijuana, then who's keeping it illegal? In the state of California, the federal government went after Todd McCormick and Peter McWilliams. I failed to see the merit in their case since the federal government themselves not only recognizes, but since 1976, they've been treating patients month after month with the use of medical marijuana. I never thought of all these things before. I really trusted everything. Blind faith is what it's called and that applies here. Uh, just like, you know, doctors I thought were gods, I guess. I certainly had trusted them enough to lose my eye. And uh, my grandma too. And your grandma. And uh, when I became, like I said, uh, the first woman, there were two men, we quickly built up the program to at least 18 people I knew of by the early 90s. I helped a couple of the next two people get in touch with Robert Brandle. After that, the procedure became easier. Doctors, we did so much publicity in California, was waking up um, doing things about medical marijuana here, uh, totally disconnected from any of us down there in Florida. But the movement was growing, and then there was this book that came out, uh, Jack Hare telling the history of hemp, and, and it was amazing the effect that book had in the colleges of our country. Really? Um, oh, yeah. People began to understand why marijuana was illegal and resent. All educated by Mr. Jack Hare, huh? The book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, became an eye to America and the world and gave enough leads for us to do the rest of the research and totally uh, prove that the things he was saying 